Good evening. Namaskar. I must clarify beforehand that my questions do not need to necessarily make me out to be an intelligent man. I don't want to be intelligent or to be taken so seriously that that's Sadhguru's responsibility to answer them. <laughs> my questions will have the curiosity of a child who wants to sort of know maybe I'm representing all of you, but I don't mind making a fool of myself as long as I get some answers. You're in a very advantageous position. That is because there can be nothing wrong with a question, only answers are a problem. Okay. <laughs> So it's advantage you, the very beginning. <laughs> Great. Let's start with my first question. There's a very intriguing people make these great prophecies about world coming to an end, etc. Will the world come to an end in 2012? So all those people who firmly believe that the world is going to come to an end the coming year, what I would tell them is, uh, we have a lot of work to do. I have lots of work to do. 2013, 1st January, because anyway 2012 the world is going to end. On 2013, 1st January, all your wealth and money and everything, please write it to Isha Foundation, there's work to do <laughs> The world is anyway going to end, what are you going to do with your money? For them this is just an entertainment. They don't believe enough to give away everything and get ready. <laughs> They just want to play with it. All vain minds are always looking at prophecies. They are looking at predictions because they don't have a plan for their life. Those who are incapable of making plans always fall back on predictions and prophecies. Yeah, but uh, I'll just request to give me two percent of that money that goes to you, our foundation <laughs> <laughs> Do you believe that there is a God? Let's come to this. Before we handle God, let's handle belief first. Mm -hmm. Why do you believe something? One believes something because they are not sincere enough to admit that they do not know. There are only two ways to be. Either you know something or you do not know something. But whatever you do not know, when you bullshit yourself, it's called as belief. Instead of simply admitting, I do not know, you want to believe something. Somebody believes there is God, somebody believes there is no God. Both are in the same boat, they think they are different, but both of them are not straight enough to admit that they do not know. What is the problem in seeing what I do not know as I do not know? They have a problem because they do not understand the immensity of I do not know. I do not know is a tremendous possibility. Only if you see, I do not know, the possibility of knowing arises within you. If you see, I do not know, the longing to know will come. If the longing comes, seeking will come. If seeking comes, the possibility is alive in your life. Everything that you do not know, if you believe, you're destroying the very possibility of knowing. There are belief systems and belief systems and belief systems, but at the same time, the idea of God is universal. Why this has come is, it is perfectly all right for people to create a God. This is the thing about this culture. Here we have thirty-three million gods and goddesses mm. because this is the only culture which understood God is our making. There's something called as Ishta Devata. You can create your own God today. If you can look at all the existing gods, if you don't like them, you can make your own God a tree in your garden, a rock in your garden, your mother, your wife, anybody you want or whatever you want. You like this vessel, you can make this your god. Nobody thinks anything weird about it in this country because we understand this is our making. After all, in every piece of creation, the hand of the creator is there. Whatever you can relate to, you use that, it's perfectly fine. I don't want to argue on this, so do you think all our epics, Mahabharat, Ramayan, Shankar, Ram, Sita, they are fake? No, they were historicity. Okay. There are buildings to prove that they were there, they're still in dispute. Mm -hmm. The dispute is on means they were definitely there, isn't it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, uh, I will still want to probe a little further on this topic. 
we have a major mandir masjid issue ayodhya issue etc etc we are still fighting about that so why is all that fighting in fighting going on if there is no god or if there is a i did not belief. say that no you said there is a belief people needed somebody as a belief all of the, god all the fight in the world is not between between good and evil as people project it to be all the fight in the world is between one man's belief versus another man's belief mm -hmm. if you saw i really do not know you wouldn't fight with anybody because you believe one thing and somebody believes something else you're invariably going to fight today or tomorrow mm. it's just a question if you can manage them for some time some day it'll spill out on the street there was a time when people worked with the instrument of belief when the human intellect was in a certain way today it is time there is substantial intellect on the planet today it is time that we establish a certain level of seeking in a human being rather than just pumping him up with belief. Why do people believe you? Who said they believe me? This is a huge full house. No, no, they're looking… Everybody is They're clapping. sitting there evaluating every word that I say. I don't think they believe whatever I say. Mm. <laughs> to me, they look smart you, enough to understand I, and evaluate. I have performed in this auditorium. It's never been so full. <laughs> so there has to be something in their belief in you which makes me, them look up at you. Why do they trust you? Why do they believe in you so much? Now let's take off the word belief. Yes, they trust me. Okay, I mean my word <laughs> may be different. Do you think that Sadhguru has powers which you don't have? They can't ride a motorcycle like me, I'm sure. What are those powers? What makes you different? What makes you special? What makes Pallavi Gupta writing a book on you and calling it you? What makes people over here, so many people I know who will not come to a function like this, they are here and they are here on time. What is it in you that makes you different? Because they know if they don't come on time, I won't let them in <laughs> But they dare not do that. So what makes you different? So what is different? It is not a question of something being different. When you don't try to be special, when you just live as life is, that you don't try to make yourself special because wanting to be special is coming from a certain unemptiness or a certain inadequacy within a human being. Where is the need to be special? Every human being is unique in his own way. If he tries to be special, he'll only end up aping somebody, he will not be himself. So, when the life is unique, every leaf on the planet is unique, every atom in the existence is unique, where is the need for you to be special, being unique is better than being special, isn't it? You have not yet answered my question <laughs> I… I feel that it's important for me to know. Yes, right What now. is unique about you? See, the very nature of the existence is like this, the very nature of what's happening around you is like this. If you convert mud into food, we call this agriculture, it's the same mud. Can you eat the mud? Can you take it on your plate and eat it? No. But if you wait, you put a seed and wait, the same mud becomes food and how we value it and eat it. But it is something else, but when you eat it, it becomes flesh and bone, it becomes you and it's so valuable for you and so many other people. So this is the way of the life. What is filth will become a flower. If only you mature it in the right direction, this flower, its beauty and its fragrance comes from filth. The more filth you put at the root, better the flowers will grow. So, the question is not about what is different, the question is not about what is special, the question is just about will you allow yourself to mature or will you let yourself just roll in filth? I feel very proud to be an Indian and I'm sure a lot of people feel, but corruption bothers me and I'm sure you also spoke about it. Do you think spirituality can help get rid of corruption to some extent? So let's understand this uh, corruption properly in its right perspective. Rather than reacting against a bunch of people who are in an advantageous position, okay? <laughs> 
Why I want you to understand this is because for the first time in the history of independent India, the sixty-four years, that means two generations of people, they have at least fifty to sixty percent of them have had such a bad deal. Today yes. you and me, we'll talk all this and go home and eat well. Correct. There's a whole bunch of people, almost four hundred million people who cannot do that. So, if we handle the next five to ten years right, we can change that. It's a tremendous possibility which is on our threshold. There's an economic possibility sitting on the threshold. If we conduct this right, we can change their lives. Those people who have not eaten properly, those children who are malnourished, which have the highest level of malnourishment, those who are not educated, those who don't have opportunities, those who are in that horrible social and economic pit, their lives can change in the next five to ten years if we conduct our act right. Every Indian should understand this. It is not just about economy means stock market. It is about hungry people who will have food on their plate. Economy does not mean stock market, economy does not mean foreign cars coming into India, economy does not mean you wear better clothes or this and that. Improving economy means there will be no hungry children in the country, which is something all of us should do something about. And that possibility is being jeopardized. Wherever I go, I speak to various economic and political leaders around the world, everybody says, we want to come to India, India is a big possibility, but the humiliation of corruption, we can't bear it. Because it's not just about money, they're willing to pay a percentage and get the work done, but the humiliation that they put through on a daily basis, which we have gotten used to, they're not willing to go through that. They said, it doesn't matter if we don't do business, but we don't want to come there and go through all that rubbish. So, this possibility is being jeopardized by a handful of people or it is wrong to say it's a handful of people, it's a nation full of corruption. Correct. Because how many people in Mumbai streets, if there is no policeman, will stop at the red light? I think only ten percent will stop. So these ninety percent are corrupt people. If they make… if you make them the chief ministers and prime ministers, you know what they will do? So instead of just calling it by one bad word called corruption, we need to understand we as a society are trying to move from a feudalistic way of managing our lives to a democratic way. The democratic way has still not sunk into us. So I am saying in our psyche, we are still feudalistic in nature, but we are trying to run a democracy. Democracy will not happen with an active sense of education as to what is democracy, what is the power of democracy, what it means, what is the responsibility of living in a democratic society. This has not been done. We just took democracy from the British and we think if they just put their oat and get their fingers dirty once in five years, everything is settled. No, we have not educated people. We are still a feudalistic society acting to be democratic. Suppose. Hypothetical question, I must announce that before that. Suppose you were made the prime minister of this country for one month, how will you change things? See, there are enough instruments in the democratic process. Making me or anybody a prime minister for one month is a cruel thing. Okay, for five years? Yes <laughs> <laughs> So you admit that one month is not sufficient? No, I, because I one understand. month is a very cruel joke. It doesn't matter who. Who comes to power for one month, he can't do anything in a nation as diverse as India. To get this nation moving, you need to understand this, you cannot move this nation with policy, with rules. You can only move this nation when anything that you want to achieve in this country, you make it a movement. If you do not make it a movement, if people do not emotionally connect to that, no rules, no policy is going to work in this country. It is only people who have been implanted from somewhere, who have not grown up with Indian people, who do not understand this. They think if you make a rule, everything is going to work. This is not Switzerland. If you announce on the notice board, everybody will follow. <laughs> Here you have to make a movement out of it. You have to make emotionally people connect to what needs to be achieved. If you are not able to do that, nothing is ever going to happen. So, whoever becomes the prime minister, I don't want to imagine myself there. <laughs> what do you think should be done? It can be very easily done. There are examples of states which are going leaps and bounds ahead. If you saw Bihar just ten years ago, 
It was just… I've driven through Bihar just wanting to see what Bihar is. It was… it just looked like Afghanistan, large parts of it. Correct. Today things are happening. Absolutely. Wonderful things are happening, just one man. Things are happening in Gujarat, just one man. Absolutely. So can't we produce twenty-five men or women like that in this country for every state? Are we so important that we cannot produce twenty-five human beings with some integrity who will do something straight for this nation? And today you don't have to do much. India is sitting on a boom time. You just have to just manage a few things and let it happen, that's all. You just have to see that economic process do not go out of control. You just have to manage that, you don't have to do anything. It's boom time, the whole world is looking towards you. The only two economies everybody is banking on is right now China and India. India is better equipped because it's a democracy, because all the numbers are scrutinized. But what is in China cannot be scrutinized, so many people are very suspicious and fearful because it's supported by the government. India has a proper corporate structure, India have a, has a reliable uh, stock market which is a reading. Indian market is open, you can study what you want, you know where you're putting your money. So definitely India would be a natural destination for every investor in the world. Only thing is they're afraid of our system. corruption, not the system, they like our system. Our corruption… Corrupt system. System is not corrupt. Corruption. Corruption. The reason <laughs> it's the people who he are manning it… He has a way it. of making me say things that he wants me to no, say. No, no, the people who are manning it, people who are manning it are the problem. But how to find them? You mentioned two states, you mentioned Gujarat and you mentioned Bihar. And strangely they are not the states which… which we have in the center. So how do we… are we politically corrupt… politically completely bankrupt? Uh, how do we do that? No, no, no. It is… it is only because common people are not participating in the democratic Correct. process. Yes. Participating in the democracy process does not just mean once in five years you cast your vote. Most people don't even do that. But I'm saying even if you do that, that is not enough. Democracy is an active sport, it's not a spectator sport. You can't sit back and say, let somebody do democracy. Democracy means you are the boss, you can't sleep on it. You have to be active to everything around you. If you do not bring that consciousness in people, that awareness and activism in people, it will not work. At the same time, for everything you protest, for everything you call a band, for everything, you know, our, it's our culture, people have understood the technology of how to stop the nation, band, hartal. But how to run the nation, it's a different technology. I am saying, at least once a month in your street, in your region, Whatever is the sticking points in your area, in your street, just make a list of that, get a few people together, whoever the councillor, the MLA, call him for a meeting, talk to him what needs to happen. Casting vote once in five years is not good enough because you employ somebody and you don't see that he works. That is not… does make sense, isn't it? I grew up in a lower middle class family, small town. As a child, I had a great sense of wonder about everything. I till today have a great sense of wonder. I'm very happy to be talking to you. I don't see that in today's children. I don't see a sense of wonder in today's children. Because they replace the wonder with WWW. <laughs> exactly. Exactly, that's right. They know the whole universe before they're six. <laughs> exactly, they know everything. They, they just have to press Google and all the information. But information does not necessarily translate into knowledge at all. So how do… Uh, and they, they always say this, that's the way I am. I don't see my grandfather even at the age of eighty-four said, ah, that's the way I am. So what is this, that's the way I am, I'm bored, dude, cool, I think that to be bad is being cool. If you say I'm a good man, he's a boring man. Usually they are <laughs> Yeah, they are for the world, for the marketing part of it. The breaking news after every fifteen minutes for millions of channels is never about good things. It's only about disaster, rape, swindling of money. We are marketing fear, we are becoming people who are 
constantly made to fail suddenly in India also that we are living in a world which is not very, very peaceful, which is, which is not to be, which is a dangerous world. We are becoming, pardon my saying, like America where we don't look at somebody for a little longer. I was in America uh, two years back. I was looking at somebody thinking whether should I ask him my hotel because in my hotel there was a mall. So I went into the mall and when I came out, I could not see my hotel because it, I must have got out from somewhere else. So I was looking at somebody to ask him whether, should I ask him where the, my hotel is? So he said, Why are what are you staring at? I being an actor, I said, am I staring at you, sir? I'm sorry. I did not know I was staring at you. Poor fellow actually dropped me to my hotel. <laughs> What my point is, <laughs> how do you retain, how does one in today's time, in these times, retain a certain amount of innocence, a certain amount of sense of wonder? How does one do that? See now, there are two things you said, wonder and innocence. Wonder does not necessarily come from innocence. Okay. See for example, when you were a child, you definitely looked up at the sky, isn't it? Absolutely. Did you ever count the stars? I used to do that in you Simla, tried. there was nothing to do. How far did you go? Oh, no, no, nothing. I could not go beyond hundred or two hundred. Ah. <laughs> so I meticulously sat down on the terrace, counting, counting, count, trying to make, you know, segments of the sky and trying to count, count, count. I've gone up to seventeen hundred and then you get mixed up. What was there is not there, what was not there has come, you know, it gets all mixed up. But today, that itself was wonder, seventeen hundred just blew my mind. Today scientists are telling you there are over hundred billion galaxies, not stars, hundred billion galaxies. So as you explore, as you know, the wonder will increase because you realize the nature of the existence, then wonder will just explode. So wonder is gone not because of lack of innocence or because of innocence, because what we call as knowledge, stupid conclusions about life. Nobody is… today people are carrying their attention deficiency like a qualification. Anything in this existence will yield to you only if you pay substantial attention to it. But now people have become like this. They can't look at anything, everything is chak, 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 chak. Now in this condition, there will be no wonder, only conclusions in your head. There is no perception, there is only, you know, monologues going in on your head. You n there is no perception. If there is perception, all noise in your head will just stop. If you're looking at something absolutely beautiful and engaging, everything stops. Why people are enjoying your cinema is just this, you switch off the lights, they focus on the thing for those whatever few minutes or ninety minutes or whatever, their usual monologues are gone, something else is happening. It is the attention which is making the difference. It is not what play… what's playing on the screen. It is what is playing on the screen is instrumental in grabbing the attention, but it is the attention, continuous attention which is making the experience of being there. So, this is a rudimentary form of meditation. It's called dharana. So, how does one in today's time retain that attention span? One simple thing is, everybody must do something about themselves. Every child, every school should bring this dimension that a child is required to pay attention to something continuously. It could be music, it could be dance. See, you cannot do music or dance unless you pay attention to it, you know. You'll make a fool of yourself if you do not pay enough attention. But you can pass an examination without attention, you understand? <laughs> That's right. I have seen this simple thing. Children came to us, we have a Asia home school, which is a very… run in a very different way. I one day went to the assembly, all these six, six and a half year old kids, they are all like this, like this, like this. I said, why are the kids like broken tops? Why are they shaking around like this? Then I just brought this thing, simply every day in the morning, Sari Gama Padanisa, fifteen minutes, everybody must do. You go there after two months, they are all sitting like this. That's all it takes. You just take them into the jungle, 
make them walk for a night without torches, without cell phones, without anything, in a protected atmosphere, you will see within one night, there'll be a tremendous transformation in the sense of wonder in the child's life. But we are making them physically incapable of these things. Sitting just in front of the computer, they're becoming physically incapable. When physically it hurts, they will protest, they'll not do anything. So it's something that parents must take care of. Bringing up your child does not mean just sending him to school and getting marks and grades and nonsense. Your child in the body and mind should grow up to full capabilities. That is when he will manifest in his life as success. Just marks will not manifest as success. For that parents also have to be… Of course. Uh, …peaceful and restful. Do you get angry? You want me to right now? <laughs> you can <laughs> It's not that I'm incapable of anger, I'm capable of everything. It is just that I have not given this privilege to anybody that they can make me angry, they can make me happy, they can make me unhappy, they can make me miserable. I have not given this privilege to anybody. <laughs> if somebody need to be shouted at, boom, I'll go. So what makes you angry? It doesn't make me angry. If they need a shouting, I'll give it to them. See, there are different kinds of people in the world. There is somebody here, if I just look at them, they'll understand why they're being looked at. There's somebody else here, if you look at them, they'll just stare back at you. <laughs> if you tell them gently, they will understand. There is somebody here, if you tell them gently, they won't get it, you have to shout at them. There's somebody else here, even if you shout, you won't… they won't get it, you have to knock them on the head and tell them. Different levels of sensitivity in the world. Your action should be appropriate to the situation in which you exist. I am not bound like this, I will not say this, I will be gentle, I will be nice, I have no such things. I am just appropriate to the situations in which I exist. What you need, I will do. If you need only shouting, I will do. <laughs> What's my problem? <laughs> What's your shortcoming? My sh shortcoming is I am not tall enough. <laughs> you are the tallest short. man right now you are here. We know I that. I came little short. <laughs> Do you feel lonely? When you're alone, if you feel lonely, obviously you're in bad company, is it? <laughs> it's a great journey to be talking to you, I must say. If you have to describe before we go to the questions to the audience, if you have to describe yourself in one word, what will that word be? Apart from mystic. Okay. <laughs> Would you consider uh, wildlife as two words or one word? For you it's one word. One word. <laughs> Life, uncultured, uncultivated, just wild and as it is, that's me. You're very warm also. <laughs> just life, nothing else. It's been very en enriching talking to you, I must say that I feel it, I feel rich. Uh, okay, so questions from the audience? Yes, please. Kiranji wants to ask a question, yes. I'm sure it's for him. Not for me <laughs> All the questions for Anupam still remain unanswered even though I've asked them very often. <laughs> so I won't attempt it again. But I want to say that I'm very privileged to finally see you in person. Your book, Mystic's Musings, which I read many years ago when I lost my brother, my younger brother, and it was a great tragedy in the family and something that I was finding very difficult to cope with. It gave me… it gave me great amount of courage and made me feel much better. Also, it talked a lot about spirits, it talked a lot about life being a continuous… continuous process. In that, you, you write about when you and your wife, everybody was constructing the Dhyanalingam. And uh, you talk about how the thread of life or the grasp of life, something to that effect, became very fragile when she could not hold on to it and she passed away. What exactly did you mean by that? The life within you manages to stick to the physicality of who you are. Physicality is something that you gathered. It is not you, it is material. It is just a piece of this planet. 
what you gathered from the planet, if it has to stick to the life that you are, you must be in a certain level of reverberance. If you drop in intensity below a certain point, you can't hold it. That is called as dying of old age. If you have seen anybody close up who are dying of old age, you will see his eyes become feeble, life becomes feeble. It's like the body is struggling to hold it, but it can't hold because it's become too feeble. If the reverberation goes below a certain level of intensity, it can't stick to the body, it will leave. So that is generally understood as leaving peacefully because without struggle it just passed on. So that is if the intensity drops. Another way to leave is you raise the pitch of life's intensity to such a pitch, it went beyond normal pitch, then also you leave the body. So spiritual sadhana is trying to get the pitch of your life to the highest point because only if the intensity of life is high, it's like the voltage is high, that's why the lights are bright. If your voltage is low, the lights will be dim, your awareness will be dim, dim your perception will be dim, all you will know is just survival process. So you want to pitch it up. So when you pitch it up beyond a certain point, there is always a danger that you will slip out. So we will fix certain things. We will fix certain things when a spiritual aspirant, aspirant is progressing with a certain rapidity, we will fix the body in a certain way so that that cannot happen. Just yesterday, ashram satsang when we were there, one lady asked, why women are asked to wear toe rings when they get married? Because marriage was supposed to be such a huge experience that they could leave the body. At the age of eight, they would marry them. They will never see each other till they are fourteen or fifteen. But emotionally, psychologically, she is cultivated and cultivated to believe that her husband is like God. When she meets him, life will explode. That possibility in the child's mind has built up. When she is physically mature, she is brought into marriage. Because in this country, in this culture, there is no business, there is no marriage, there is no child, there is no family. Everything is just a tool towards your liberation and mukti. You get married because you want to use that as a tool to your liberation. You raise children because you want to use that as a tool to your liberation. You become a sannyasi because you want to use that. It does not matter what you do. Everything is towards your mukti or liberation. Because of this, they nurtured this girl and boy in such a way that for four to six years they have not seen each other but they are made to believe when they meet something is going to happen. In the child's mind, it's grown to such a big possibility. Something does not mean like how today's teenagers are thinking, something means there's only one thing, there's no something, okay <laughs> They are not thinking about that one thing alone. It is not just two bodies meeting, not just two minds and emotions meeting, two lives being merged into one. So we created various devices, you know there's something called as Mangal Sutra. Sutra means… What, what is a kite in Hindi? Patang. Patang, is it? You have a sutra for that? Yeah, door. So if you have the right kind of sutra, the kite will fly. So the Mangal Sutra is that, that you prepare it in certain way, it's an energy thread and you are supposed to replace it every year. Somebody who knows what it is m gives you a live sutra, matches the husband and wife, their energies in such a way, they are not just bound in body, mind and emotion, they are bound as two lives. Any number of events have happened like this in the past which is becoming more and more rare these days. If a man or a woman dies, within forty days the husband or wife will also just die. Have you heard of this? Yes, yes. There was a time when the film people were singing Janam, Janam, all that. Now they're talking expiry date for relationships <laughs> No Janam, Janam songs anymore? No Janam, Janam songs, <laughs> no. Because the idea was to bind two lives. How the bodies match, how the minds match, emotions match is not important. Two lives are entwined. So there is a kind of bonding. 
many of them have never spoken to each other, there is a bonding which is unexplainable. The sense of bond that they felt was so deep because it was a scientific process of binding two lives in such a way that there is no question of compatibility, this, that, it doesn't matter. You marry a devil, still you're bound and you feel an ecstatic sense within you simply because of the union within yourself, not because of what somebody else is doing. So now in a marriage, what somebody else is doing or you, what your husband or wife is doing doesn't matter, just the way you are is an explosive experience. This is how lot of women lived in the past, because the process was very scientific and it was done properly. So they put this metal on the toes and also on the ring finger always, because if there is metal on certain strategic places in your body, you will not accidentally leave your body. So when you do spiritual sadhana, when we notice somebody is becoming very intense, first thing is, I will gift them a simple copper ring, which they must wear. They must wear and they cannot remove without permission. Because if this simple metal is on the ring finger, when they get into certain states of exuberance, by accident they will not slip out of the body. So she got into such exuberant states. Naturally, certain little bit of jewelry things were there. These things were never discussed till that point. The many things I refuse to discuss because devices will work well only when people do not know how it works. So we just put it on people, we never explain. But when this situation happened, I had to explain what happened. She sat there on a full moon day evening with everybody. There were people around and after five minutes, it is in the shrine, she got up and went. My eyes are closed, I knew she got up. I got little irritated because nobody ever gets up once they sit down. Till we say it is time, nobody ever gets up. And of all the people, my wife getting up and going, little irritation in me. One… why… why is she getting up of all the people? Then I ignored it and I sat down. After five minutes, she came and sat down. In another seven, eight minutes, she just went like that. When I looked, she was gone with a… with a big smile on her face. Then I looked, she has removed her nose ring, she has removed her bangles, she removed her toe… toe rings. See, she did not know intellectually, but at that moment she felt this is what is stopping her. And she pulled out all those things, kept next to the… next to the wash basin and came back. And she sat down within seven, eight minutes. But this is not something that happened accidentally. She announced this almost nine months ahead of time. She had prepared my girl who was only seven years at that time, uh, that she's going to leave in this month, but it happened one month early for various reasons, so that's a different aspect. But this is not new in this country. Any number of yogis just sit down, announce to everybody and leave their body. She was not somebody who was steeped in spiritual sadhana. She's just a very alive, she's either up or down, you know. She's either absolutely exuberant or down. She doesn't know the in-between. <laughs> She's not somebody who would, whom you would consider a yogi or established in sadhana, nothing like that. She's a very exuberant person and that's all it takes, that you're alive, that's all it takes. It's not that you know this or that, you're just hundred percent alive. That's the only qualification you need. And she started working towards it, she announced it nine months ahead, we tried to sabotage it in so many ways to slow it down, but it went the way it went. <laughs> yes, please. At the Isha Yoga Center in Coimbatore, near the samadhi of your wife is a photograph which sent shivers down my spine. The feelings are of sheer ecstasy in my interpretation. How does one achieve that level of ecstasy in life? So every life that is here is capable of joy, is capable of blissfulness, is capable of ecstasy. The only problem is they are not able to sustain it. The problem is of sustainability. Everybody knows moments of all this. But to be there, to be there, you have not built the necessary foundations. See, if there is a wall, you can jump up and have a peep or you can go on a trampoline 
and have a little longer peep, but you'll come down. But if you build a ladder, which is not so romantic as jumping, but if you climb up, you're across the wall. Instead of calling it by different names like blissfulness, ecstasy, this, that, pleasantness, highest level of pleasantness, this is what every human being wants. If your body is pleasant, we say it is health. If it becomes very pleasant, we say it's pleasure. If your mind is pleasant, we say this is peace. If it becomes very pleasant, we say this is joy. If your emotions are pleasant, we say this is love. If it becomes very pleasant, we say it's compassion. If your very life energies are pleasant, we say this is bliss. If it is very pleasant, we say this is ecstasy. If your surroundings have become pleasant, we say you're a success. This is all every human being is seeking, isn't it? Nothing more. You want your insides pleasant, you want your outsides pleasant. This is all a human being is seeking. Outside pleasantness, you need people's cooperation. Yes? It is a craft. You have to arrange, you have to compromise, you have to deal with situations properly. Creating outside pleasantness is a certain talent, a certain capability. Not everybody is able to do the same thing on the outside. But when it comes to interiority, all of us are equally capable. Nobody has come better endowed than the other. Every human being is capable of the same thing in the inward dimension. So, somebody is sitting in a state of ecstasy, how to get there, is it possible for me? Don't even ask the question, is it possible? If it is possible for me, it is for sure possible for you. But what I do on the outside, is it possible for you? Maybe, may not be. But what I do on the inside, is it possible for me? Definitely, definitely possible. Inner experience, nobody can be denied. External capabilities are different. So, what needs to be done? Whatever you've been through, the inner engineering is the fundamental. You… if you get this one thing right, you will naturally grow into that. The problem is, every day you keep undoing it, <laughs> you understand? So every day in the morning you do this, now we're giving the Isha Kriya City also all over Mumbai, but every day in the morning you give yourself a three-minute crash course in inner engineering. You will see, in three months' time, you will be feeling very pleasant. In six months' time, if you simply look at a tree, you will burst into ecstasy. If you look at a cloud, you will burn… burst into ecstasy. If you close your eyes, you will get there. No matter what, you just need an excuse, you will become like that, for sure. Because these are the fundamentals. That is… that's why I'm saying it's engineering because if you want to engineer something, you have to do it right, otherwise it will not work. You can't somehow… see, you want to build this building, you can't somehow place something and hope it will stand. It will not stand. You have to place it in a certain way, then only the building stands up, isn't it? Similarly, you have to hold yourself in a certain way, then only this experience holds up, otherwise moments up and then down. Also, I feel, uh, with your permission, I think if you uh, depend on others to make you happy, I think there's a possibility you may not be happy. If you decide that you need to decide to be happy, then why, there is a why possibility… Why are you underestimating her husband? Okay <laughs> Okay. Good evening, all of you. Guruji, I would like to know, you know, man is always craving for more and more and not happy at all with whatever he gets. Of course, you just explained now how happiness is an internal state of being. What would you tell to normal people as to how to get peace and happiness in their lives? <laughs> the problem is not that human beings are craving for more, they are craving too little. Right now, instead of… when human consciousness is able to grasp the whole cosmos, instead of craving for that, they are craving for an apartment in Mumbai. <laughs> Just stupid <laughs> So their suffering is not because they are craving for more, they are craving for too little. They conjuice even in their craving. <laughs> that is their problem. Please crave for everything you will be wonderful, there will be no misery. You are craving for little things, that's your problem. When 
such a big possibility is there, going for this is very… it's criminal, I would say. <laughs> so it is because of this crime they are suffering, they are being punished for this crime, not for craving too much, they are not craving enough. When creation and creator is possible, they just want this little piece of property, that's all they're thinking of, they can't think beyond that, so they suffer for limiting themselves, not because of craving for too much. Can I do a chant? Yes, please. Kurcharan Kritam Va Kaya Jam Karma Jam Va Shravana Nayana Jam Va Manasam Va Paradham Vihitam avihitam va sarvam etat chamasva jaya jaya karunabde jaya jaya karunabde Aam Shri Mahadev Shambho Now, uh, immediately the question is, what is the prayer? It's not a prayer. There is… you need to understand there are no prayers in this culture, there are only invocations. Prayers are a recent happening. Prayer means you're trying to talk to somebody. Invocation means you're trying to bring out what is the greatest thing within you. Now, what this chant, to put it uh, in a simplest form, is everything – the earth that I walk upon, the air that I breathe, the water that I drink, the food that I eat, the very space in which we exist, the hand of the Creator is active. The only most beautiful thing that you can do is to be absolutely involved with this, but still not distort the hand of the creation. You do not distort the hand of the creator. That is, something that you do is an aberration to what the creator intends. The intelligence behind creation, what it is intending, to be in tune with that, not to do some rubbish of your own thing. So, this is a journey from being a piece of creation, to being the creator. Every human being is capable of this. It's my wish and my blessing. This should become the reality in your life. Thank you very much for being here.